Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, video lecture. This is going to be on oscillators and the Web Audio API. Now if you saw the previous lecture, the Hello World lecture, you've already been introduced to oscillators. So I'm going to be fairly brief over some elements of the code in order to get to the more interesting aspects. And also, although you've seen oscillators in use, you haven't really had them formally explained as a node and how that node works. So let's dive into that right now. So an oscillator is essentially any periodic signal, any audio signal repeating over time. And it's a fundamental building block of what is known as additive synthesis. Additive synthesis is a method to create sounds, potentially very realistic sounds or very musical sounds. And the idea behind additive synthesis is that any signal can be created by summing up lots of simple oscillators. In fact, one can look at um, this approach to additive synthesis as really the whole idea behind the Fourier series, which is taking sine waves, summing them together, slightly di uh, differences in amplitude and frequency, and can construct any signal that way. But there's standard oscillators that are used in synthesizers over and over again. And uh, we also in a previous lecture talked about uh, sound synthesis and the synthesizer. And built into almost any musical synthesizer is the capability to create sine waves, triangle waves, square waves, sawtooth waves. And we'll talk about all of them and also synthesizers might create many other types of waves, which we'll talk about throughout this series of lectures. But all of those standard oscillators can be created in the Web Audio API with what is known as the oscillator node. It's one of the methods um, for the audio context, or you can um, create an audio node directly for any given audio context. In addition to the sine, triangle, square, and sawtooth, the oscillator node also allows you to create your own types of oscillators. We'll talk about that. In fact, that will be most of um, what we will be discussing in this recorded lecture. So, what are those four waves? Well, the sine wave is perhaps the most fundamental wave used in digital signal processing, in audio and music and so on. You've certainly seen it before. Here we have two periods of a sine wave with a frequency of two hertz. So that's two periods and one second. Hence, but to show two periods, we have one second on the x-axis. And the sine wave, um, the initial phase is set to zero, so it's just sine of 2 pi times this fundamental frequency times time. We can also look at a few of the other waves. There's the square wave, which is basically one half the time minus one the other half of the time. And so one simple way to write down what this is, let me just correct a minor mistake on the slide. is just to take the sign, so the, uh, set it to plus one if it's positive, minus one if it's negative, the sign SGEN, short for SIGN, of the sine wave from the previous slide. So that's a square wave right there, simply flipping back and forth between two values, usually defined as plus one and minus one. Then we have the triangle wave. You can guess what that looks like. Um, it's continually rising half the time, linear slope, and then continually falling. And with its default values, it reaches a maximum of one, of one and has a minimum of minus one. Over on the right, we've given an equation for uh, the triangle wave as a function of its fundamental frequency F0. And if you look over here, I hope you can see it, we say, um, we look at F0, so the frequency times time plus one half, and we take the highest integer number below or equal to that value. So it's the value just below, equal or just below, whatever is that actual value there. That's what this notation means. And well, that function gives us the triangle, 
Finally, we have the saw tooth, named because it looks like the teeth on a saw. So continually rising, then suddenly has a very sharp edge, drops down to its minimum value, rises up again back to the maximum of one and back down. And on the right, we have the formula for this one. Somewhat similar, but definitely not identical to the formula for a triangle wave. Now, I should note that these waves that we've been looking at, um, they can be defined slightly differently in different texts. There's many different mathematical notations that give the same uh, result. I simply chose one that's easy to write down. But those are the formulas for sawtooth, saw sine wave, triangle, and square, very common waves. As you will see over the course of this lecture, they are not uh, implemented in the web audio API and in most systems exactly in this form. There's some subtlety there. So how does it actually work, the notation? You would have seen this already when we gave a simple Hello World application that basically just creates an oscillator and plays it out. And it does that using um, either a call to oscillator node to this function, which generates an oscillator, we decided to call it tone, or one can, for an audio context, which we've called context, call the method create oscillator. The, the end result is exactly the same. But there's one nice thing about the first notation, which is any parameters that you want to set, you can set them when the node is created this way. If you use create oscillator or similar functions for any node, then you don't, it, it automatically gets set to the default values of all of the parameters. And you need to, on new lines, put in the, value, the actual values of those parameters if they differ from the default. So, um, what are those parameters? Well, there's, it's a simple node. There's only three parameters that come with the node. The type of wave, waveform, sine, square, sawtooth, triangle, or what's known as custom, which is what we'll be talking about later, how you create your own different types of oscillators. There's the frequency, which you set in Hertz, uh, so, uh, cycles or periods per second, um, sorry, cycles per second, or one over the frequency is the period. So how long in seconds or milliseconds before it starts to repeat. The default value is 440 hertz, well-known uh, value on the musical scale. There's also an additional parameter, which is quite useful if you're thinking of things in terms of music and common music notation, standard Western notation for music but really in every other sense, an unnecessary parameter. It's what's known as to tune, and it simply changes the frequency that is actually generated. Um, it offsets it from the default frequency or from the frequency that you have set. So to tune is an offset in um, what's known as sense. So um, there are, 1200 cents in one octave. The default value is zero. In other words, it doesn't change the frequency at all. But what the actual frequency is that is generated is given here at the bottom, the computed oscillator frequency equals the frequency that has been set by the frequency parameter times two to the power detune over 1200. So if the detune amount is 1200 exactly, you would be doubling the frequency. But the reason why I say to tune is not needed and the reason why I rarely use it is because you can always just reset the frequency. Frequency equals what it was set at before times whatever you want to change it to. So that's the start. And I would have shown you um, an example, but I already showed you a quite useful example uh, showing creating an oscillator using an oscillator um, with modifying the type and the frequency. I showed you that in the Hello World in uh, previous lecture. But where things get interesting 
is when you want to create your own custom oscillator type. How do you do that? So let's step aside and give a little bit of theory here. Well, I'm not going to bombard you with lots of math, but I'm going to sort of give you just enough to understand some key concepts here. And we have what is known as the Fourier series, uh, named after Joseph Fourier. And the story is Fourier was a mathematician and he was serving in Napoleon's army in Egypt, but it was a lot hotter from, uh, than the region in France he was from got him thinking about heat, how do we model it, what equations can be used to analyze it, and came up with what is known, now known as Fourier analysis. So the Fourier transform, the Fourier series, all derived from the ideas he had back then. Many of the mathematicians and scientists were involved, but a lot of key concepts are come out of his mathematical treatises. And one of those key concepts is the idea that any periodic function can be represented as just a sum of cosine and sine waves where they start at one fundamental frequency, the frequency of that periodic function, and include more cosine and sine waves at two times that frequency, three times that frequency, four times, and so on. And that's what's done here. The first term is a constant value. Essentially, it's like setting the frequency to zero. Um, and so it gives you a DC offset, a sort of um, just constant term that shifts that sum of sine and cosine waves up or down from having an average value of zero to some new average value. F0 is the fundamental frequency, the frequency of the periodic function that we had mentioned. And then this is the whole of it. A0 over 2 is used here just because it works out quite nice if we're going back and forth to, say, complex notation, or we're looking at ways in which these coefficients from the Fourier series, the AK and the BK terms, can be calculated given a known periodic function. But we're not diving into that. We're showing just enough in order to understand how the oscillator node works. So this same formula here can be rewritten in terms of what are known as um, complex sinusoids. So here we have C sub n rather than AK or BK. N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we have E to the J, so some complex exponential, N times omega zero. Omega, by the way, is just 2 pi F. So it's a sort of um, re-representation of a frequency here. And what we're basically saying is any periodic function can be represented as a sum of complex exponentials. So e to the j something is just cosine that something plus j sine that something, com uh, real and imaginary terms. The cn, coefficients can be written in terms of real and imaginary components and there's a nice equivalency between the a values from the first formula and the b values from uh, that first formula and the c values. Ignore the fact that these are subscripted n there, b, b's are subscripted n. We're still looking at the integer values a1, a2, a3 and so on. So because we have this no um, relationship, because the ANs come from the real components of the complex coefficients and the BNs come from the imaginary components, the ANs are often known as the real terms, the BNs as the imaginary terms. Right, how do we use that formula? I've rewritten the formula at the top here. So let's look at those standard waveforms, the uh, oscillator types we've already discussed. How can we write a, a, a single sine wave from this? Well, that's easy. Set a zero to zero, set a k to zero, and just use the very first bk term. Um, so there's another mistake on this slide, which I will fix. There we go. Um,
And so we're just keeping one term in the series and that gives our si us our sine wave, which here is d depicted for a sine wave uh, with a frequency of two hertz. If we have a, a square wave, then the terms, I haven't shown the math here, but the terms can be given as two over n pi, one minus, minus one to the n. So the first thing is you can see that when n is even, this minus one to the n becomes just one. So it's one minus one. So there are no even terms, only odd terms, b1, b3, b5. If we take the first three of those terms, and we basically end up summing three sine waves, we get this function here, which does not look exactly like a square wave, but it's pretty close. A triangle wave, you can see that, and here we aren't showing how the b's are found. You basically do an integral um, of the uh, periodic function that you know about in order to derive what the coefficients will be. But the a terms are all set to zero. The b terms look like this. If we look at the first three non-zero terms, summing them those sine waves together, we get this starting to look really close, even after just three terms, to an actual triangle wave. And the reason why it's so close is because a triangle wave isn't that far from a sinusoidal wave already. So your starting point is already fairly good. Sawtooth wave, same sort of idea. Here are the coefficients, all the A terms are zero. And we just have this series of uh, of B terms. So, how many terms do you need in the Fourier series? And we need to know this because we have this infinity there. We know that three terms doesn't give a very good representation. It's close, but not close enough. But we're not going to add an infinity of terms. That's too many. And I did say before that the oscillator node, when you're using the default types, you don't get exactly a, a square wave, a sawtooth wave, etc. You don't because you don't use all of the terms. You're representing these waves in terms of this formula, but only using a small number of terms. Why? It's because of something known as aliasing. And if you've taken digital signal processing or even been introduced to digital audio, you're probably at least heard of this, if not very aware of it. But probably the simplest short way I can um, get the idea across is by giving you a simple example. So here I have two waveforms, one in blue, seven hertz. So it goes through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven periods over one second. Another one just goes one, two, three periods over one second, so three hertz. And I'm going to sample both of these signals, the blue and the red. I'm gonna sample them at 10 hertz. So one, sa uh, sorry, 10 samples a second, or every 0.1 seconds I take a new sample. So there's one at time zero, another one at time 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and so on. And what we see is that although these sinusoids are different frequency, once I sample them, they appear exactly the same. The red curve and the blue curve have the same values every time, time I place one of these black dots there. So I can't distinguish these two signals together once they've been sampled. So there were two famous engineer, mathematician, scientists, Harry Nyquist and Claude Shannon. Nyquist came uh, a bit earlier. I think his main paper related to this was in the mid to late 1920s. And it was quite a, a dry paper. I, I've read it and it's very topical. It's talking about problems with telegraphs and how to transmit over long underground lines with very noisy signals. Claude Shannon dealt with the same problem, but he has a very readable paper that is 
probably just as relevant today as it was back then. So I, I would recommend Shannon's papers where he essentially introduces um, a lot of concepts from information theory. But in particular, he has a paper discussing what is now known as the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, or just the sampling theorem, where he proves something that Harry Nyquist had already mentioned, but Claude proves that if you are sampling a signal at fixed times, and that signal has a variety of frequency content, then you need to sample at least twice every period for any uh, frequency in that signal. So if you are sampling, say, um, a 7 hertz signal, you should sample it at at least 14 hertz. If you are sampling a 3 hertz signal, you should sample that at at, at least 6 hertz. So if you are sampling um, something with a 7 hertz or a 3 hertz, make sure it's at at least 14 hertz. Otherwise, you may not be able to differentiate some of these signals. Another way to say what Shannon and Nyquist found out is that the sampling frequency when digitizing a signal should be at least twice the highest frequency in the signal. That highest free, or flipping it around, the highest frequency in the signal should be less than half the sampling frequency. Now we call that half the, the sampling frequency the Nyquist frequency. So in other words, if one is sampling at 40 kilohertz, then um, the highest frequency should be 20 kilohertz or less, 20,000 samples per second. And by the way, um, Claude Shannon, really amazing guy. He also invented things like a, a rocket-powered Frisbee, gasoline-powered pogo stick, um, a, a robotic mouse that can race through mazes uh, faster than other mice, a calculator that ran on Roman numerals, and so many other things, as well as the entirety of information theory, or at least the foundations of information theory. So setting the seed for data transmission and a lot of internet technologies. But that I could speak for hours about him. So that's the idea of aliasing. If you don't sample a signal at a high enough frequency, you won't be able to, to distinguish some frequencies from other frequencies. One will alias onto the other. So, what does this say about the Fourier series? When do we need to cut off that Fourier frequencies? The answer is we should not keep any terms in that series beyond half the sampling frequency, so beyond Nyquist. Let's give an example. We have a 4 kilohertz sawtooth wave with a sampling frequency of 44.1 kilohertz. So, that sawtooth wave is actually the sum of a 4 kilohertz sine wave, 4 kilohertz cosine wave, plus multiples of that, 8 kilohertz, 12 kilohertz, 16 kilohertz, and on. So if we kept that sawtooth wave exactly as it initially looks, we'd have all of these high frequencies beyond Nyquist, they'd alias back, we would hear that it wouldn't sound right. We know we should only keep terms in the Fourier series expansion below half that sampling frequency or below 22.05 kilohertz. Which multiples of 4 kilohertz are below that? Just the first five. 4 kilohertz, 8, 12, 16, and 20. So we can now write out all of the Fourier series expansion and see what we get for our sawtooth wave. Here is the equation for the Fourier series. We know that only some of the B n term or the, the B terms are kept. So we keep the first five B terms. We're essentially keeping all of these, the BK or as it was written below, B n, BK sine two pi k F zero T. Here's what's done. We have a 2 over n pi, 2 over pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi. And we have the uh, sine term right here. 
and the plus negative plus negative the the sine SIGN flipping back and forth. This is what it looks like. This is what would actually be used for the oscillator node when it's generating a sawtooth wave. It doesn't keep the higher terms. They would all alias back, essentially create a, um, a modified version of the signal with lower amplitude, but still audible components that should not have been there. Now we know everything we need to know about the periodic wave. We can go ahead and, uh, or we, we know the math behind it. We can now figure out how with the oscillator node, we can create our own oscillators. Uh, that's done using what's known as periodic wave. There are two methods, create periodic wave and set periodic wave. This is how it works. We create the arrays of A and B values for the Fourier series. These are sometimes referred to as, jumping back, the real and imaginary terms. Checking that I said real for A and imaginary for B. Um, we create those array arrays. We can then, so they're just floating point arrays of numbers, uh, the values of all of the coefficients up to whatever we want as our maximum value. We create the periodic wave by calling the audio context create periodic wave with A and B. And then we call the oscillator nodes set periodic wave with the periodic wave you just created. Now it doesn't matter if the oscillator node has already been set to a different type. As soon as we set periodic wave, it gets reset to whatever is this custom periodic wave that we've just created. Let's look at an example here. The, we're going to create something called a pulse wave and we'll make quite a few differences or quite will do quite a few things that making it different from the previous examples in order to show off some of the features here and also because it's quite a useful wave for a lot of purposes. So I'll define it this way. I'll start off with the square wave, which you've already seen and note that the square wave is just one type of pulse wave. The pulse wave has one important additional parameter that the square wave does not. It, it's also more flexible in other ways. But the main thing is that it has what's known as duty cycle. Rather than flipping back and forth equally between, say, plus one and minus one, between its maximum and minimum, it can spend a lot more time at the maximum or a lot more time at the minimum. And the percentage or ratio of the time spent at its maximum value compared to its total time is known as the duty cycle. So a square wave equal time at maximum and minimum has a duty cycle of 50%. But now these functions can be de defined in many different ways and there are benefits for doing that. So let's consider a pulse wave defined with a few more differences. First off, it's not going to flip back and forth between plus one and minus one, back and forth between zero and one. So this is like a pulse occurring at regular intervals. Tick, tick, tick. Um, it can have long gaps of silence in between those intervals. How much of a gap depends on the duty cycle. But um, bursts of one, then back to silence, and bursts of one. So um, it has a period. We'll define the duty cycle as um, d over t. So D being the amount of uh, time it spends at its maximum value. And we'll have that set so that zero is in the middle of that maximum value, minus D over two to plus D over two. Hence, we can write one period as shown below, where it's one from minus D over two to plus D over two. And then as long as it's outside that range, then, um, or, or, sorry, this is defining it from minus t over two to t over two. And in that area around zero, it's at its maximum value. 
Beyond that, it's at its minimum value of zero. So the coefficients, nowhere in these slides are we actually deriving the coefficient values. We're just giving what they're known as. Um, but by analyzing the periodic wave, you can determine the coefficients. Usually, though, people would just use a, a mathematical package or some built-in function to derive the Fourier series coefficients. But here they are for the pulse wave that was just described. So this now is how it's implemented. Let's look at this. We have basically a um, couple of sliders, one to adjust frequency, one to adjust the duty cycle. We define an audio context. We define an oscillator node with a given frequency. And here we're picking quite a low one, 10 hertz. This next line is an interesting one. We define some maximum coefficient, which is less than or equal to um, the coefficient of, or sorry, how do I say this? So we find half the sampling frequency, that sample rate over two, and the maximum coefficient is determined as the um, highest possible value that any of the coefficients can have as long as they are below Nyquist. So we're enforcing that we're cutting off our Fourier series before we get terms that alias back down. Then we just have this line for setting coefficients. I haven't defined any of the imaginary coefficients other than saying that the first one is zero. And by the way, and this is important, um, when one generates a periodic wave, always you have no control over it. The real coefficient, the, the first real coefficient, real of zero, and the first imaginary are always zero. Even if I try setting them to other values, it will treat it as if those are zero. But so here we set the coefficients of the Fourier series. And we right here, this long line, is doing exactly what this is. It's defining two times sine um, pi i, which is the n value there, times pi times d over t, or our duty cycle value. And divided by i times pi is divided by n times pi here. And then we did just a neat little trick just to make the code compact. We have source so source is our oscillator node. We've set it to a periodic wave, and the periodic wave we've chosen comes from create periodic wave real and imaginary as defined. And I do it this way because I'm only using that periodic wave I created only here to set a periodic wave for an oscillator node. So I, I don't need two separate lines for doing it. Also, I have a duty cycle control or slider. Every time I change the duty cycle, this equation gives a new value. So I need to recalculate all of the coefficients. So there's actually a lot of processing going on here when I change the duty cycle. Let's see what this does. Hopefully you will hear this. Can't guarantee it though. Yes, it works. So it's quite a low frequency. So I'm really hearing 10 times a second turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. Let's increase that.
Hopefully you all heard that okay. Now, I want you to look down here. This is the pulse wave we create. It's pretty good. It does what it says on, on the tin, does, does what was planned. It, there's some approximation, of course, because we truncate the Fourier series. But the one thing to note is it's not zero to one as planned. Rather, it's about minus 0 0.25 to 0 0.75. And there's a couple of reasons why it's not perfect. Let's see if I explain it. Aha, no, I do, do not. When you set a periodic wave, that waveform can be normalized or not. The normalization basically ensures that the maximum value of that waveform is always one. Here, I think, let me check, I, I left it with the default set as is, so it does try to normalize the waveform. And, but the other thing that changed, you're not seeing the normalized one here. Um, the other thing that changed is, it sets these first coefficients to zero there, and zero there. Here, by the way, I think I did turn normalization off, but it sets these coefficients to zero. So I'm not getting the DC offset that I want. So this signal, because it's spending a lot more of its time below zero and most of its time above zero, close to closer to one, what it does is it has an average value of zero. So you're basically getting, um, I think, one quarter of the time this value, three quarters of the time that value, such that the average value is set to zero. So really, if I wanted it to be exactly or as close to just a Fourier series approximation of this wave as possible, I would have needed to add a DC offset in there. And I can do that by using another oscillator, uh, sorry, another type of node, the constant source node, and just adding or connecting that to the output as well, so that I add some constant amount to uh, the output of this pulse wave. But we don't really hear a DC offset, we just hear the cyclic behavior, the turning on and off of the signal. And so that's what we get, and it is working. So that's an example of creating a signal using the, or creating a periodic wave using a set periodic wave and create periodic wave and building a custom type of oscillator. So once again, please do get in touch if you have any questions and thank you very much.